evening, good morning, good afternoon to wherever you guys are. It's always a pleasure to share learning and connect with educators from around the world. I think just to give you a little bit of an overview of who I am and where I'm coming from, I think it's best to go through numbers. I've been an educator for the past 17 years now, 30 out of which a PYP coordinator, a PYP homeroom teacher. I think I've gone through toddlers and two-year-olds all the way to grade six in my time. I've done some MYP and DPTOK as well. So those are my, my loves, the classroom, and especially the early years. I'm very much a play advocate. Uh, the last 17 years have been all over Europe, Asia, and here Asia Pacific, especially in the last nine years here in China and Malaysia. And today I'm hailing at you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where me and my family have been for the past three years. And in my roles, I've been a teacher, a coordinator, and in the last seven years also, and I've been visiting team leader, workshop leader, consultant, and well, I think I'm a learner. I think all these roles are there for me to learn, which is why today's opportunity is also for me not only to connect and share my experiences and my research and my findings, but also learn from your experiences and tune into your communities and the findings you've been making in your communities regarding, regarding blended learning. So like Shraddha said, please make sure to connect on social media before and after. And now without further ado, because we're really working with a tight time frame, let's connect like with every good professional learning inquiry. Let's just dive in and empathize, tune in and connect to the known. I'm curious to hear from you in the chat window. Where are you coming from when it comes to blended learning? What do you think blended learning is? And what do you think, have your, what have your experiences with blended learning model have been like so, so far? Whether it's distance learning or maybe in other capacities where your school has already had tries at the blended learning model or the flipped classroom model. Hi guys, so please feel free to sort of leave your comments in the chat box. So Mihar Katrinar, hi Mihai, he says a mix of face-to-face -face and online learning. Um, and I know he is uh, currently in Doha. So that's what they're doing there. Uh, Samira as well says a mix of face-to-face -face and online. Um, Brenda says synchronous and asynchronous learning experiences at the moment. Uh, Helen says blended learning is uh, having work be created on by the students at home. Interesting, we'll explore that further. Um, Kanchan says having to flip my classroom, covering concepts in class and self-directed at home. So Aga looks like a lot of people are doing a blend of both synchronous, asynchronous, at home, at school. That's what it sounds like. And it's great because we're coming from, in a way, from the place of known. You're going to have a lot of practical examples for yourself to connect to. Now, for me and in my school setting, blended learning has been and is the blend of those two paths where like you've mentioned, some of the learning is happening online or remotely where students have control over time, place or pace at which they're learning and which elements of it or the menu that we present to them online, they're choosing from and picking for their own personalized learning path and parts of it are happening in supervised brick and mortar school institution location away from home. So it's all about that blend but then also to make that more specific, that blend is there for the children to have a very personalized learning experience. So those modalities, the element of the student's learning path being so personalized is very important in blended learning. And I think this is also a moment where when we're tuning in, it's nice to distance and disassociate ourselves from what blended learning isn't. Because very often we hear examples of practice that is very tech rich, that are a lot of applications used or very fancy tool used or very popular waves of certain tools and fevers of certain tools used. But if we're not thinking about the process and how and why we're using that tool, if we're only focusing on the what, it becomes just tech rich instruction. And I think today when we're unpacking the best of both worlds, this is what we're going to focus on, the why and the how of blended learning, making sure that students' learning is personalized, that children are really harnessing the best, 
we're looking at that rather than, oh, what are the great tools that are out there right now? We're all busy educators. We've done our share of browsing on social media. We know that there is a rich variety of tools, but it's important to remember that blended learning and just using these tools in the classroom to make it very tech rich are not the same thing. And now, as we're finding out in today's session, you may want to find out things beyond the session. There will be a wakeless resource collection shared. I think Shraddha will be able to do that for you in the chat window, or you can see it through the blog post later. There is a collection of resources I'm referring to already shared with you online. But the scoop from today's session predominantly should be looking at those key strengths of what currently your school has to offer from your own context. What is the best of the online and distance learning experiences that we can offer our children? How to create spaces where that learning can happen and be curated in your community? And like I said, I keep saying your community because it's important to recognize we're going to be coming at this from your personal experiences, from your schools and communities context. Another step we'll be looking at how to best engage our kids and extend, amplify their voices, choices, and give them the true ownership of the learning process through blended learning, and then some hacks and tricks. So things that have helped me and my school in my context or our context take the best out of the blended learning situation or currently in 2020, the distance learning situation. Now, as we begin to sort things out, it's important, like I said, to come at it from your context, from your current situation, which is why for me, one of the greatest takeaways of Total Ties, the conference in June, was the Cherish Change and Chuck Reflection Protocol. I think I took it from Alex, AKA Danger Boy, who's a principal in Germany in one of the international schools using Total there. And I loved his Total Ties presentation on their distance learning model. I adapted it for the needs of my community. And what we did in the last two, three weeks of school in June, just now, we went through this Cherish Change Chuck reflection. We looked at elements of the brick and mortar classroom that we know and love and know that work for our students in our context. We looked at those elements that needed changing or tweaking to actually become effective and those who we were willing to let go. And we did the same thing for distance teaching and learning because that's how we call our remote learning or online learning. And the same for pastoral care relationships with students student well-being, but also teacher well-being. Because through linking to all these elements, you may see that certain models may look great to begin with, but are hard to be sustained by the hardworking teachers, their timelines, and everything else that's coming at the community. So this is the moment where you get to cherish, change, and chuck. So to have as many stakeholders in the process as possible to make sure that you're coming from the place of knowledge. So what I would like you to pause and reflect on now is if you were to do that in your setting, just coming from your school as an example, whether you're an educator, a coordinator, an administrator, what would you think, what would you say your school most cherishes about being in the physical school, in the physical building, the brick and mortar school? What do you think you've learned to cherish most out of the last three, four months from the distance learning model? What were those biggest yay and highs and takeaways that you were really, really happy with? From the brick and mortar that you've missed and from distance learning that you've just learned that this is mind blowing, my kids need this. So Agra, just right off the bat, there's a lot of people who are saying that they like your application of Cherish Change Chuck to this phase as well. Uh, and it's really helping them process this flow easily. So uh, thanks for adding that in. Uh, Andrea says community is something that like she is cherishing at this moment. Uh, and I see a lot of people actually saying that building relationships, building community. Uh, Daniel simply puts each other, right? Just the contact with each other. Uh, relationships, team building from Donna, collaboration from Nandini. Um, Nirali says she cherishes the virtual class that she has for 14 minutes every day because it gives her that contact, uh, I'm guessing. So honestly, a lot of people who are saying relationships, 
being connected, togetherness, community. Um, so I think a lot of cherishes. So that's nice to see people are staying optimistic and looking at the positives. Okay, well, this is interesting because I'm either clairvoyant or <laughs> we're just in a room full of amazing teachers. And I think both of these statements may be true because I'm gypsy of descent. So let's see what I hypothetically put together based mm -hmm. on a little bit of the findings from my team and our reflections through departments, through our classrooms, and what I'm assuming based on research is the biggest cherish of the brick and mortar classroom. And as you can see, this is what you've been saying. Face-to-face -face contact is number one, building relationships and building community. So it's great that as educators, we have really done our homework over the past couple of years. And 2020 has been like the SAT of all our experiences and has brought us to the drawing board. And we are emerging, let's say, semi-successful at this point. We'll see what the other half of 2020 has to throw at us. But th these are the strengths of brick and mortar. Now, as for the strengths of online and remote learning or distance learning models, however you call them, this is the element of student ownership, flexible timeline, that access to a variety of tech-based resources and content that the children can choose to go through at any given space and time. And again, that space for collaboration that can happen through different tools, communication tools for sharing, reflecting, and again, amplifying students' voice. So when we finally get to blended learning, which is supposed to harness the potential of like we've mentioned in the title of this webinar, this total talk, it's supposed to harness the potential of the brick and mortar and the online learning. With blended learning, it's all about that flexibility and choice. It's about creating options for personalized paths for student learning, where children can take time and are guided not only by their teachers, but their intrinsic curiosities, wanderings, passions, their self-initiated inquiries. So in a way, blended learning really harnesses student agency. As you can see, it's only been 15 minutes, but it's already a lot, which is why I would like to take a breath now and just tell you that wherever you begin, it has to be about you. It's not about what this total talk brings to you. It's not about what you think is hip or popular right now. It's about your community. Always start with the why you're doing it. We're doing it as educators to make our communities better, to make our students learning more engaging, relevant, challenging, significant, to, to again bestow on them that agency they already have, but sometimes as schools and institutions, we forget they have it. So this is the part where you need to take what's best for your community and consider things like cultural responsiveness, equity, access to technology. You may not always have this and certain models will not work in certain scenarios. And now where we dive into the models, yes, Shraddha, Aga, I can see Yeah, like a lot it. of people want you to go to the previous slide because I think they sure, were okay. uh, taking a look. Uh, yeah, so maybe we can give them 30 seconds to look through this. No problem. And you know, Agav, as, as people are just quickly looking at this, the, the second you said agency, uh, Siba Irene from the audience exactly said that, like said, you know, it's a unique time where I'm seeing my students actually, uh, you know, take more agency in their learning, though I miss seeing them. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. great. I think we can move on because people are, But yeah, I think thanks. that's the power of letting go, right? With blended yeah. learning, we let go, but yeah. we're going to talk about it. We let go intentionally and purposefully. Yeah. So as anyone who would have to let go intentionally and purposefully, we have to do our homework. And now where we do our homework, we have to do our research. So today I'll give you a really speed dating like overview of what are the key seven models out there. And all my research has been predominantly led by Blended Learning Universe coming out of Christensen Institute in Silicon Valley. I took my courses and training with them, I think three years ago when I really started looking into this model for our community. But their resources are also sh shared on the wakelet if you wanna do that research for yourself later. Now let's dive into those models. Now station rotation is a typical model 
that you may know and already recognize from your classroom is those center-based locations around your classroom or your learning lounge where some of the instruction happens in a small group some of the small group work is done by the students among themselves. There are different collaborative activities, stations, and some of the work happens online, whether children are on the sofas with their iPads in a you know, program with instruction there, whether it's you know, reading workshops or math workshops that are happening online, whether kids are researching, browsing, viewing. So there is a rotation happening within the space of your classroom. Another type of rotation is very similar in practice. So there are different types of instruction, small group, large group, so more direct, indirect. However, they're not happening in the space of one classroom. They're happening in the space of, let's say, one floor or maybe a couple of floors where you're also using your ICT lab. If as a school, children don't have a direct access to computers, tech, iPads, whatever you're using, whatever the device of choice is physically in your classroom, this is a typical model you would be using, a lab rotation where throughout the day children access tech and online based instruction in the ICT lab in your school if you have one. Now another model is individual rotation and we're closing in more on agency here. This is where you have the offerings, let's say, in the classroom or on the floor and children like in a studio model are moving based on a more open-ended schedule or what we sometimes call a playlist that they negotiated with their teacher on that day. And we know quite a few schools here in Asia Pacific that have gone into studio models to support learner agency. And this is a blended model that would work in their settings where kids in the morning or on Monday negotiate the schedule, AKA playlist for the whole week of offerings that may happen in the classroom, such as workshops led by teachers or other students and online. So there is that, that very individual rotation and mix. Flipped classroom is an auto model and you may recognize this model predominantly from middle high school uh, scenarios where you have some of that content being an instruction being reflected and explored on at home and then coming to the school setting and being able to really focus on being active. Activating that knowledge, activating those skills, running projects, having immediate audience there, having feedback from your other peers or your teachers. So that's the flipped classroom model. And sometimes, interestingly enough, when people speak of blended uh, learning, they will say flipped classroom and blended learning are synonyms. When actually one, blended learning is an umbrella concept and flipped classroom is one of the iterations of this model. So it was an interesting finding for myself because I used to think I can use these terms interchangeably. So that was my aha moment when I was inquiring into it. Another model, and that's my favorite one, that's the agency reigns model, is a flex model where you have kids throughout their school day and week fully managing their playlist. They still check with their teachers regarding the timetable that they're on knowing where to go to specialist classes, where to go to, let's say, physical education, art, music, whatnot. However, predominantly their homeroom teaching time is spent in different kinds of labs and breakout rooms and centers where majority of instruction is given online. So when you're seeing your teacher, you're seeing that teacher for either intervention or maybe leading a discussion, receiving feedback, it's super flexible. And like I said, majority of the content presented by the teacher or prompts happens online. We're almost there. Two more models to go, bear with me. A la carte is something very, very characteristic of high schools who wanna offer kids more electives. So let's imagine you have children who wanna study Spanish or Japanese, but your classroom, your school doesn't have that in their current course uh, offerings for the students. You may then get kids on Coursera, on other platforms for online learning or in MOOCs, and the kids can have that experience, as you call it here, a la carte, which means it might be happening from home, from school, but it's not happening and it's not delivered by you specifically as a course provider. It's done by a third party. Now, the final model is the enriched virtual model. And this is something that it's either used in tertiary education predominantly, that's where we know it from. If you've done your master's online, or if you're doing now your PhD online, 
this is something that you know very well because you spend majority of your time in face-to-face -face online situation with your teachers, colleague, a lot of content being shared still asynchronously and you either fly in for a summer course or you come into school once a month or once a weekend and so on. So this is the uh, model that requires least face-to-face -face contact in a physical school or an institution. So as you can see, there is a lot out there. And the importance of this overview is that you need to be able to take bits and pieces of each of the models and blend it into, which is why the blended model, something that works for your community. And I think we can take a pause here, maybe reflect a little bit internally to ourselves, what does it mean for us as educators? But I think this is also a moment where we have to recognize why we're even here. Why are we looking collectively across the world, 300 plus of us and more, at blended learning? Well, we are looking at it because 2020 has really served us quite of a kerfuffle of a situation for us educators and our families and our children. And we're now bracing for the new normal for reopening our schools and campuses, for coming back to a whole set of new rules. In a way, it's the same game. We're still trying to give our kids the best of education, but the rules have changed. And we're scrambling now as educators and communities to pick the best of what we know to build this new world, to build this new normal for our kids. And now, as you know, blended learning is not the the holistic approach to everything that's going to happen in our schools. As schools, we're now developing protocols for everything else that will change for us. The time, our schedules, you know, kids coming into school in smaller groups or in cohorts or doing the regular routines, even like putting away backpacks or water bottles at such a, a slower pace, access to spaces, access to resources, all of that is and will be changing to make sure that we're being more hygienic, that we're following the protocols for social distancing, that we're giving kids that extra layer and level of safety and security in our classrooms. So I like to call it the slow flow because in a way to me, we're all slowing down. And even though I'm speeding up the way I'm, I'm pitching this to you, I think next year for a lot of us communities of learning is about slowing down in everything we do, which is why what we do today this inquiry into the blended learning model is also under that umbrella. If we're slowing down, then everything we will do will have to be more intentional and more purposeful because in a way, our children do not have time to waste and we don't want as good educators to be wasting their time. So now without further ado, let's jump into those core elements of agency and let's see how we can harness that in a blended learning model. So let's first begin with choice. And choice may look differently in different communities, but it's all about asking ourselves, why do you wanna learn? And when I say ourselves, it's the classroom community, the students there. How best do you guys learn? Where do you best wanna learn? Who do you wanna learn with? What do you want to learn? And I think just starting from that point, of knowing your target audience, AKA your student population, your kids in your classroom, that's the time where real blended learning can start happening. So if we can just stop for a second, and if you think to yourself, what are the situations? What have been the situations in the past semester where you have seen the most choice offered to your students? What has given your kids the most choice? Uh, Aga, can you go back to the previous slide and maybe sure park thing. there, please? Yeah. Sure. So thing. guys, please feel free to sort of, you know, um, share your comments here in the chat window. Uh, you know, as uh, people reflect, Aga, uh, I see Claudia Cabale say open-ended tasks that a love uh, for choice and different outcomes is something that's you know useful yeah. to do um conscience has the choice of research during units of inquiry um yeah there's a lot of questions about doing this for the early years aga but i think we can park those questions towards the end 
uh, and maybe revisit them. Um, so guys, please feel free to leave your and questions. And just to in give the... you an idea, yeah. this particular resource was created for early years parents. So when we first went into distance learning, this was one of the webinars we ran with our parents to make them realize that that choice and that balance based on the approaches to learning skills was core to their children's successful distance learning experience. Having that variety of being everything, a thinker, a researcher, a social person at home, a communicator. So we've created a lot of tools to prep our parents' understanding as well of this model and how to best harness that learning for their little ones. I think that's fantastic oh. context, really, because, you know, always the question is, how do you do this for the early years? So that's great that you actually built it for that. A few more examples. Uh, Shikhan, Elizabeth says, uh, say, choice boards uh, are something that they're using. Uh, Tanga Lakshmi says, personal projects. A lot of people saying choice boards, actually. You'll um, see some of those in a moment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exhibition well, choices yeah. and ways to present uh, writing tasks with two different options, maybe. Um, yeah, so a bunch of great ideas and a quick thank you to you all for selecting all panelists and attendees because this way you get to sort of see each other's ideas as well. Yeah. But see, this is brilliant because mm -hmm. we have such an amazing acumen of educators yeah. that we know we're not stumbling upon this. We're on the right path and we're yeah. just doing even more research right now and consolidating to know where to take this and how to bring it home for our kids to really give them the best of the best. And yeah. like you've said, a lot of times that choice comes from the physical representation of choice. However, when we represent choice, the kids, we have to be present for them visually as well. We know that in our international school communities or even local school communities, we have kids coming from different linguistic background, from different uh, learning um, conditions, and they need to be helped with access as much as possible. So one of the first things we developed, and again, we developed it in multiple languages. This is just an example of a English-based and a Chinese-based choice board. But we've taken back everything to how do children best learn. And we know that in PYP, that's all based in approaches to learning skills. Children knowing how to be communicators, how to socialize, how to self-manage, how to think, how to be reflective, and how to research. So we've created this one-stop shop for both parents and children on a PDF. So what you're seeing is a JPEG. So these links are not active, but under each and every of these avatars that you're seeing here and visual little um, clip arts, you would call them, or infographics, there was a link for our children. So if it said communication skills and it said reading, it took them, for example, to Epic or to any other reading program that your school has to offer. If it was speaking, it took them to a speaking app that listens to them and responds. Listening, podcasts, audiobooks, audible, whatnot. Writing, a website like Literacy Shed or another website that offers great self-paced reading and writing workshops for children. So each of these was already hooked into something meaningful for the children so they wouldn't have to run around and think, if I'm struggling with my self-management and I don't know how to do it well, where should I go? Okay, I'll click on the schedule and it's going to take me to a sample of schedules that I can build for my day online. If I'm struggling with research, I'm going to go to media information and it's going to take me to my, let's say Google course on digital literacy and I'm going to go to internet land and help myself. So we wanted the kids to become more and more self-reliant, to build that not only choice, but that self-efficacy that comes with agency. So that was one of the things we developed. Less is more, one-stop shops. A lot of people are really appreciating that uh, infographic, Aga, and that it's very well, uh, you know, it's very well aligned with the ATLs. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that one. And I think we'll be embedding similar things in the, in the blog and then yes. further on the communities. Yeah. So we'll have that in Japanese, Chinese, Korean and English shared later. Okay, now another element, and like I said, we're constantly looking at approaches to learning skills because that's our core of how kids learn best. Another element of choice we're giving our kids were different projects around being researcher, being a thinker, being a communicator. So we created choice boards 
for early years and full elementary that offered different projects. And now here's the clue that were remote learning and distance learning, but were not online learning because we were really looking out for our children's well-being and we will continue doing that. And we wanted to make sure that to our families, educating our parents, blended learning, distance learning did not directly mean online learning. There is a difference because your kids can be at home, but they may be engaged in very hands-on projects. And we've created that portfolio of over 36 different projects that were ATL based and driven for early years and another set of those for elementary that did not require being online or the final stage, which was using the portfolio features, for example, was the only online element to share what you've been doing, to share what you've been working on or what you found out. So that was another thing to develop a menu of things that would not keep the kids glued to the screen, but still would give them that personalized element of choice and really going with something that they were interested in having a lot of a lot of choice. And now knowing our children and our population, we are a school that's based predominantly in design thinking and the arts. So our children are driven by certain passions and we kind of crowd as a community around those passions and they're very visible in our community. So we made cho uh, choices and choice boards around children's interests. We had gorgeous choice boards for art and expression and visual arts. This is as an example of a choice board built, I think, for my early years or grade one KG. This is just a cutout, but we've had, again, eight of these choice boards across all grade levels going through all elements of STEAM. How to be a scientist, how to be a tech genius, how to be an engineer, an artist, a mathematician. And these were offered to the community on a weekly basis where we were adding more and more choices around STEAM. And we had STEAM projects, weekly celebrations, STEAM assemblies happening to again, showcase children who are sending these things at us through their portfolios, following their passions. So again, that was not only choice, but harnessing the children's voice as they were making those choices and making those ownership moments and elements of what they really liked and enjoyed. And again, you'll be able to find that. I think it's already been shared multiple times on my Twitter, all of these boards and on my website, it will be linked into the blog. So don't worry, you don't have to screenshot it or take photos of it. If you like it, you can just reach out to Shraddha or, or I, and we'll be happy to share it with you. You can find it on Total Communities a little bit later as well. We'll be taking it there, right? Yeah, and that's something that I'm super excited about because it makes the whole thing very, very practical in terms of directly, you know, having uh, students use them and also, you know, assign it, use it in your own like unit plans in the classroom. So uh, as I initially mentioned, you know, Total Community is basically uh, this one-stop shop for all of US PYP educators to really collaborate and access amazing activities like the ones Aga is talking about. She's also going to be contributing very soon, so you can find a lot of these uh, ready for you to use. Uh, very simply put, here's you know a quick visual of what this might look like on community. You see hundreds of unit plans and learning experiences you can um, look at. You can go to the next slide, Aga. Um, this is basically how you know your learning experience looks like. Um, you can feel free to use it in your own classroom add it to your unit or even just assign it to your uh, students directly. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is an exciting feature, right? Like uh, blended learning truly, you know, your children are at home many a times and uh, want to be doing this by themselves as well. So you can select your students and add this to them. Um, and Aga, if you go to the next slide, this is something you could do as a teacher. Uh, is basically, you know, they can send it back to you. Uh, you can send them instructions in multiple formats and they can send stuff back to you in multiple formats, which I think really stresses on that whole agency piece because we want to give them multiple opportunities for expression. And if you go to the next slide, we kind of uh, also show you how you as a teacher could give, um, you know, feedback to every individual student on their work, which also becomes, uh, you know, refreshing for the child because they get, uh, they get, uh, you know, solid inputs on the work that they're doing. 
uh, yeah, so that's just some quick, you know, view on visibility on how community kind of incorporates what Aga's talking about. And Aga, we are super excited for you to be, you know, contributing to community and yeah, sharing this learning even further. Well, happy as well. Yeah. And I think when we talk a community, we think immediately of voice. And if the last three months of distance learning has taught me something is that there's never been a better time to capture and notice and amplify children's voice because it was simply unavoidable. You would see it everywhere. Kids were posting at you. They were just like Shraddha said, in their portfolios recording for you, writing to you, to one another, their voices. They were capturing clips of themselves in different tools and in different formats. So even if until now, you didn't have one stop or one perfect solution for capturing your children's voice. Now you know that in blended learning, in that online element component of blended learning, that automatically gets noticed and gets documented and you by default start responding to it more and more. And because of that, you amplify your children's voice and you give them that accountability too. So that's one of the important choices. When you go with blended learning, you by default give yourself that upper hand on harnessing children's potential and giving them that agency. And there are different ways of doing it. And I think Shredda gave us great examples from Toto, which it is, I agree, a one-stop shop for all of these functionalities. And I think an example that for me really brought it home in June was seeing our kids come through a year long process of, you know, inquiring into their exhibition global goals and problems and then emerging out of the whole process with over 1,200 people audience. Probably some of you were in that audience, so I want to thank you because just that amplification that happened by opening ourselves up, not to just to the school community or other international communities element, but to a global community is one of the strengths of the blended model, being able to provide your children with a wider platform where they can truly shine. And that is a two-way street. You will see that children knowing that they're listened to by more people, that they're tuned into by more people, by more colleagues, peers, they really shape up. And even the kids who are not fans of being very communicative, being very stage forward, they really, take a grip on themselves and they deliver. And we were really surprised to see our ESOL children who would normally communicate through writing only deliver their presentations, both in Korean and English and Japanese, beautifully in those three days with the wide community of people whom they've never met except for their parents and their closest colleagues. So this element of voice in blended learning, it does shine and come through almost naturally for your children. Now, just to give you an idea, and I'm going to just share one because we're quite short on time, how you talk to your children, that intentionality of the language and the discourse in the blended learning model and in the distance learning model is very important. So you may want to be, even with the youngest ones, very explicit. So just to give you an example of a colleague addressing second graders, talking to them about reflection process on their research project into architecture and structural design of their final unit of this year. Just a quick example. Good morning, grade two. Now that we are on to the final stages of our architect design um, for our buildings, we are going to be looking at our reflection on the whole process of being an architect, our design, our building that we've created, and now our final product and looking at how we feel about it, what we think about the whole process that we did over that we have done over the last um, couple of days and from last week. So three, two, one reflection. Three, you are going to explain three things in a video that you really enjoy about the process or about your building. For example, you could say, I really enjoyed going out and exploring and looking at different buildings, um, what their purpose was, looking at, you know, houses and how some of them look different to others and looking at how different maybe a hospital building is compared to my apartment building. So three different things that you enjoy. In the same video, you talk about two things that you would like to explore more. For example, I might say, when I was constructing my building, I had made a really tall building 
out of really loose materials. So my building didn't stay up right the way I wanted it to. I want to explore using different materials or maybe making my building a bit smaller so that the whole structure and building stays nice and strong. So that's an example of the two things that you would like to talk about that you would like to explore more. And thirdly, number one, so three, two, one, one is reflecting on someone else's work. Put a lovely comment or a considerate comment on someone else's post about them being an architect. Choose someone that hasn't had anyone else respond to their video. It's so that we can ensure everyone gets a nice kind response um, from someone else in, in grade two. So as you can see, we're very intentional and we're very purposeful and explicit in how we address children online. This is that part where I said, we don't wanna waste children's time. So when we are in the blended learning model, it almost takes us back to our drawing board as educators, thinking about how we instruct. What is our discourse of the classroom? What is it that we really want to distill and tell our students? And that responsiveness from the students is almost coached by us and by the way we talk to them in the blended learning setting. We're gonna skip some of my examples because we're running short of time, but I think that feature is really visible in the total student pro portfolio, isn't it, Shredda? Yeah, I think so too, you know, and I feel like uh, there was so much intentionality with which your, uh, the, your colleague essentially shared these uh, this guidance with students. I think it's like technology should sort of assist and enable teachers to do their best work. And the total student portfolio, I feel is like a pretty, pretty cool feature in that sense, because very easily you're able to sort of keep, uh, you know, a continuous track and foster really good agency for students. Uh, so these are just some, you know, a quick look at what that might look like. And if you go to the next slide, Aga, you, uh, you're also going to be able to, you know, equip your students with tools, to define their personal projects and their exhibition ideas even. Uh, going back to your you know, thoughts on agency, you can monitor their progress, review their work, provide feedback to them. And uh, I think one of the cooler parts is also the fact that when it comes down to evidence collection and presentation, uh, which a lot of schools spend a lot of time putting together, all that is already done for you using these like different portfolios um, and uh, that becomes a really useful resource for schools as well, yeah. And now moving on to the final part, we've talked about choice, we've talked about voice, now onto ownership. These all blend together, because like you have seen, the way we provide choice, whether it's through choice boards or one-stop shop solutions in a classroom that's set up online, the way we let children move through the model online or uh, on site in the physical school building, that gives them also a lot of ownership. That choice of the timetable, and everything they're going to do within what they're going to, to do throughout the school day or the day at home that they're spending predominantly online. So that ownership is embedded there. But I think there are ways in which you can harness it even more. And being able to take ownership of certain classroom rituals, such as assemblies, and be able to lead certain class meetings online or assemblies or sharing sessions, share we call them at, at my school, and give kids that ownership of a ritual that predominantly in brick and mortar was a ritual or was a routine led by teachers is another way of showing how much accountability and how much trust we put in them. So that's been one of our discoveries. And with that come the concepts of curation, creation, and my favorite that blends it all, documentation as learning. And some of you may already be, fa be familiar with this term of documenting as learning. It's been recently really amplified by a dear colleague of mine, Silvia Tolisano. And her work with documenting as learning has been a great guidance for us. And if you look at your community and how you can harness things, whether it's through TOTAL and the TOTAL classroom and the TOTAL portfolio, whether it's through other formats, it's important that the work is done both by you and the students. If you're creating a new resource, if you're creating a resource collection, if you're sharing something new, if you're participating in an event, come out to your kids first. Ask them what part they would like to play with it, in it. If they would like to be curators, collecting other pieces 
of information from their colleagues, whether they would like to create an element or they would like to just be documenting the process as curators and, and people who are reflecting on the process for later assessment on how well it's gone as an assembly or a share -thon or maybe a class project. So there are multiple roles here within ownership. But I think I've mentioned documenting as learning being such a one-stop shop solution as a process because it looks at ways in which we really focus on how we're learning. So it's taking us back to the ATLs, to approaches to learning skills, taking us back to reflection and assessment as learning. And we know that in the enhanced PYP and again in the blended learning classroom, in that model, it's really important that all of us are continually reflecting on our practice, that we're not choosing things because ah, a time filler, I'll just do this one off, that we're being intentional, that the practices we use in the classroom, the physical classroom, in the online classroom are the cherished ones, like we said in the beginning, because we have no time to waste, which is why documenting as learning through the online portfolio, through kids actively participating in the online classroom sphere and the physical classroom, take them through that learning process that becomes the automatic formative assessment. And they, as curators, are so much more in charge of everything that happens around them. And they're able to tackle ways of making their learning more visible, more shareable to the people in their communities, and just through that amplified with them reaching that higher level of accountability, knowing that they are out there being in that digital presence. We're almost there, I promise. And, and this is something that I wanted to, to talk to you briefly through and surprise you because my tips and hacks are not tools. I believe that process trumps tool. And we've had with Shraddha a funny discussion about it because I do know that they're interrelated. However, I still think that if you had to choose between a new tool that you wanna to introduce to your community to support yeah. blended learning, I would still say do not introduce a new tool. Yeah. Don't take your school on a crazy carousel ride. Work with the processes to really harness the best out of the tools you have. And that is something that I will leave you with. Less is more. So truly involve your people and your community into looking at what they cherish and works for them and the kids you have in your midst, in the physical classroom, in the online distance learning situations you've been in throughout the last four months. Go through less is more to be able to truly reflect on what you wanna harness and take onto that new normal and the model. And then look at your community know that you really need to meet them where they are, that element of equity, cultural responsiveness, especially right now, being even more awakened to that element, and then being intentional and purposeful. So not starting from a place of what is the latest tool that other schools are using, but asking yourself, why are we creating this blended model? We are creating it for the new normal because we cannot go business as usual, right? How are we going to do it in our school context? Have a think with the entire school community, engage all stakeholders, and then make your learning, even that early inquiry into blended learning, very visible. Share it with your community, amplify it, so that your journey, that documenting as learning, is giving you the next step. You're currently giving yourself that feedback on, okay, what should I be doing last? And Finally, something that drives me, my values, but I hope they can help you too. Just be courageous and be kind. And thank you so, so very much for being here today. And I wouldn't be myself if I didn't finish with a call to action. I hope that these things that we did today can be actionable for you. So just a little simple three to one, which as you can see, it's my colleagues and my personal favorite out of visible thinking routines something that you can take away, something that still challenges you, and maybe something that you can do immediately after this talk. And that is getting a cup of coffee, tea, lunch, <laughs> or a break. <laughs>